Okay, so we're almost ready to have the system go ahead and create the database based on our classes using this DB context, right? The only issue is, by default, Entity Framework will create every one-to-many relationship with Cascade Delete turned on. Remember what Cascade Delete does, right? You delete a parent object, and all the related child objects are deleted as well. Okay? It's a massacre. All those children, you know, marched off to the edge of the cliff and whatever, right? So we don't want that to happen. There's some times when you do want Cascade Delete, but most of the time, we probably don't. For some reason, it's the default. I'll be honest with you, with the earlier .NET Framework version, I could just remove that convention and then have it always default to the opposite way, not having Cascade Delete, right? We can't do that here, but we can, for each relationship, specify. In order to do that, what we use is called, and you can Google this quickly, the Fluent, don't do it now, watch me instead. The Fluent API, okay? Fluent API helps us to specify. What we do is we override the on model creating event of the DB context. So on this code, I'm going to pull over. Might as well get it all at once and we'll just talk about it, right? I'm going to override the on model creating event of the DB context. So when it creates the model, I want to do three things. First one here, I should have put a comment, but I don't have one. I'm going to set a default schema. The default schema, okay, you remember in SQL Server, every table, every object you create has a schema. What's the default schema? Anyone remember? Three letters. Begins with D, ends in O. <laughs> DBO, right? Database owner, right? That's what it stands for. That's the default schema. If you don't specify otherwise, every object you create gets the schema DBO. But you may or may not have noticed in some of the databases that there's additional schemas available. Right? You can create your own schemas, so it's useful in a large system where you have a large number of tables. You might have all the tables related to inventory in one schema, and all the ones related to human resources functionality in a different schema. Just a way to help organize things when you have a lot of objects to sort through sometimes. Right? Well, I like to set it a schema for every DB context. The reason for that is I'm cheap. Because when you start hosting these applications up in the cloud somewhere, you pay for every database, right? It's a lot cheaper to have one larger database than two separate ones, right? So if you have multiple applications you eventually want to host, you can easily reuse the same database just by having separate schemas for each application, <laughs> okay? So it's just a very useful thing. Uh, with our student access to Azure, we get a fair bit of free Azure service but you're going to uh, be limited in how many databases you can have, free databases, right? So this is a way to get around that limitation. Give a schema and you can have, you know, one application that has an employee table and a separate application with its own employee table, for example. In separate schemas, they can live happily in the same database. So that's why I like to throw in a default schema. Okay, the next chunk of code here, this is for that cascade delete, right? So basically what we're doing, we're saying, hey, model builder, that entity called doctor, okay? I want to tell you a bit about him. Uh, truth is, everything right down to here is already taken care of with the way we put the annotations and so on on our properties and use the naming conventions for our properties. Everything is done for us already except that last line. So I'm kind of repeating stuff that's already configured just by how we built our model classes, right? Basically saying, hey, that entity doctor has many patients, right? And each patient has one doctor. So it's defining the one-to-many relationship. Oh, by the way, it also has a foreign key of doctor ID, right? That's good. That would have worked even without putting this bit of code in. But I have to repeat all that just to get to this line, right? What I want to say is on delete, the, the blah, 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 delete behavior <laughs> is restrict. In other words... No, you're restricted from deleting a doctor that has patients, right? So by putting this bit of code in, when it generates the tables, it will not enable cascade delete, right? It'll set cascade delete to false. Okay, so it's a long explanation, and I have to do all this extra work just to specify that I don't want the doctors to be deleted if they're related patients. Now the last one down here, okay, I want the OHIP number to have a unique constraint. No two patients patients should have the same OHIP number, right? 
Just ask anybody in the, in the Ontario government, and they'll tell you that, right? Can't have two people the same OHIP number, that'll confuse their billing, right? So we should enforce the same thing in the database. So that's what we're doing here. We're saying that entity called patient has an index, okay, on the OHIP, and it is unique, right? So that's it. This is an example of using that Fluent API. In the earlier days of Entity Framework, you had to do the Fluent API to define everything. And they started adding more and more conventions and so on to the just way we can just make the model classes. So there's less and less need to write this kind of code. But unfortunately, there's a little bit sometimes where we have to do it. Okay, just for an example, with the uh, version 6 of Entity Framework for .NET Framework, I wouldn't have to do this anymore. There's an annotation I could just put called index. I can just annotate uh, a property or even a collection of properties if it's a composite index, right, right in the model class. Unfortunately, that's not supported yet with .NET Core, so we have to do it with the Fluent API. Okay, but that's it for the changes we have to make inside of our DB context. So we're ready to do the migration. Let me show you what happens if I don't. This is kind of instructional. Okay, if I try to run it first, it'll come up. Now I haven't added the uh, menu options yet, but I can just use the routing that's built in here. I can just go backslash doctors or patients, it doesn't matter which. Ah, sorry. Ah. And there we go. Database operation failed because we haven't made the database yet, right? So it was trying to call up the database on that DB context phone and there was no answer. So it's suggesting, oh, guess what? Here's what you should do. Add a migration, give it a name and update the database. That's all it takes, two lines of code in the package manager console or you can do it through this new command prompt in the project directory. But for now, I'm gonna stick with the package manager console, okay? But it's helpful that it gives us a guide on what to do. So migrations have become simpler than they used to be. It used to be we had to enable migrations first, but that happens as soon as we add migration. Okay? So to get the package manager console, you can go tools, down here to NuGet package manager, there's the package manager console. Also, it's a bit of a shortcut. What I often do, notice this quick launch in the upper right corner here, Visual Studio. You can get to all kinds of features and things very quickly through here. If I start typing P A C K, look at, there it is right there. Package Manager Console. That, sometimes I find using this quick launch is easier to get things up if you forget where on earth they're buried in the menu system, right? So all it is, it's a, a PowerShell interface down here. How many people have used PowerShell before? Okay, you're going to do a course where you use it soon. <laughs> okay. But PowerShell, it, it's a command prompt type of thing. It has a built-in help or IntelliSense system, but it's based on the tab key, right? So if I start typing add M and then hit the tab key, it takes a little while to spin up the first time. Okay, then you see it's narrowed down by the characters I've typed. Right? So I can get add migration, okay? I could give it a name, right? Uh, initial create or something, and that's enough for now because it's gonna give me an error. I'm going to get an error when I do this, though. Let me zoom so you can see this clearly from the back of the room. Oh, that color scheme's awful. <laughs> More than one DB context was found. Oh, darn, I wasn't specific enough, right? Yeah, remember there's that application DB context that was there, and we added our own medical office context, right? So we have to specify the name of the context we want to add a migration for because there's more than one, right? No big deal. By the way, in PowerShell, you can use the up arrow to go to previous commands. You know, even if the last 10 commands, doesn't matter. I'll just go back through them all. So I can bring up that add migration. It even tells me there to go dash context. And if I hit the tab character, it even completes it for me. So the context is my medical office context. Okay, now don't push enter yet, but I could and it would work. The reason I say don't push it yet, I'm just checking if I spelled it right, um, is it would, by default, create a new migrations folder in the root of the solution. 
but I want to keep things organized nicely. I like the fact that this data folder is here. It already has a migrations folder in it, so I'm being a little bit careful if I try to add another one, it has to have a different name. But here's where I'd like to organize everything related with the data layer, right? I've got my context objects in there, and I want to add my new migrations in here as well. So I can do that by specifying dash O. O is short for output, right? And then I just have to say the name of the folder. So I start with the root of the solution. So I say data. Let me zoom because people are squinting. Backslash. And then I can make up a new folder name. Uh, maybe I'll call it MO for medical office. MO migrations. Okay. So that's my entire command. Now add migration. Now, of course, it's still looking for a name. But you know, if, if I leave that off, it's not the end of the world because when I press enter, it says, oh, wait a second. You got to supply value for the following parameter, the name for my migration. Migrations have to have a name. I can call it Fred, Fido, Fluffy, you know, anything I want. But initial or initial create, something like that is pretty typical. I'll just call it initial. And there we go. And off it runs, creating this migration. If I want to put a name here, it's just this name? Uh, any name. It has to be some yeah. character. Oh, yeah. Yeah, just a space and a name after the command. All right. Okay, so we have our migration. Now, if you look up top, you'll see that we actually have the migration. My initial. Did I spell wrong? <laughs> That's okay. Uh, uh, and it has two parts to it. I'll just shrink these down so you can see there's an up and a down okay like life it's full of ups and downs the whole idea of these migrations if you look over to the right inside the solution folder so here's my mo migrations notice that beside the name i gave it this incorrectly spelled initial right there's a whole date year month day hour minute second timestamp thing that's how it knows when you apply a series of migrations over time that's how it keeps them in order, right? By that sort of timestamp. The whole idea is that we can make incremental changes. Oh, I forgot. I need an extra property of my patient object or whatever. Or I want to change something. Well, you can make whatever changes to your models you want. You don't have to throw out the database. You just add a new migration, and it will write code to modify the database to keep it synchronized with the schema of your models, right? So it uses this approach with the uh, time stamp, so to speak, to allow us to do that. And the up and the down, as we apply each migration in sequence, okay, then we execute the code in the up. If you want to roll back, you know, oh, that was a bad idea. We shouldn't have done that. So we're going to roll back to an earlier migration. It applies the code in the down. So that's how migrations work. So inside the up, what do we see? Well, we see a whole bunch of... Uh, Create tables, right? We have a schema set up, creating table for the doctor, creating table for the patient. Now, mind you, these are not SQL. This is still C sharp, right? But, oh, well, there's our uh, indexes and so on and so forth that we need, right? So that's all in the up. The down just has a couple of drop table commands, right? So this will be taken by the system and converted into actual SQL commands in a moment, okay? Uh, maybe I'll just do that and then we'll be finished. So I'll say pack since I closed it, get it up on the screen again. So what I have to do here, I have to say update database, but I have to always, because I have two contacts, specify which one. So I can just bring up the last command because it has this filled in. Change add migration to update database. And this part at the end is optional. I could leave it there, it won't actually hurt, right? The specifying, but it only has to be done once. From now on, any up uh, migrations for this context will be done in the right location. Okay, so when I give the command to update database for my medical office context, it actually is gonna go and build the database. Takes it a moment or two. And if you scroll back up through this, you'll actually get to see the create table statements that were created, right? 
Now there's more here than just our doctor and patient. You'll see references to a migrations table, migration history. That is maintained in the database as well, so the system can know whether or not you're in sync. Okay? If your model schema is synchronized with the database schema. Okay? So it keeps track of that with this migration history table inside the database. And now the difference is when I run, we're almost there, when I run this time, Go to the doctor's controller. Here's my doctor index page. I can go create new, right? If I click create and leave those blank, there's those error messages that we added in our data annotations, right? First name, David. I always wanted to be a doctor. There we go. Spelled my name wrong. Oh, let's edit, okay? Save but I really haven't quite earned the credential yet, so I can go delete. Okay, are you sure you want to delete this? Delete, back to the list and it's empty, right? Same thing for patients. Now, you'll notice a couple things here, right? I go create new, notice I even have a drop-down list for doc, oh, I don't have any doctors though. <laughs> That's not gonna work. Can't create a patient without a doctor because of referential integrity. I should have left my Dr. Dave there. Uh, Dr. Jim Smith. Okay, I have to have a doctor first. Now I can go to patients. Create a new patient. And, you know, again, if I click create, look at all these messages. Cannot leave the OHIP number blank. Start typing letters in. Then it must be exactly 10 numeric digits. So all that validation is coming into play. But what I wanted to point out is the drop-down list, right? I only have one doctor. If I had more doctors, I'd see them here. And it's only showing the first name. So there's some work to be done. All right. So, but that's good enough for now. I think we're going to stop there. Uh, we'll talk more about the migrations and so on. Uh, we'll continue on with the work that needs to be done, but that's a good place to stop.